All right, everybody. It is Steve, the Rogue Scholar, and it is a big, huge crowd today of four. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry I'm a couple minutes late. Um, it's been tough, man. You didn't think that this kind of day when most people are on vacation would be <laughs> just sort of, you know, it'd be a dead day at work. Wrong. It's been busier than I ever dreamed it would be. Um, in any event, Today's conversation is going to be about something. I'm going to connect a bunch of things together. This is really important to me. I hope it works for you guys. I would do my best. Do my best. And thank you, Double K. Before I get started, let me thank you for that wonderful uh, $49.99 super chat. Thank you so much. And uh, glad everybody could make it to join us today. But Today's conversation is going to be on fear and how fear is preventing us from seeing the possibilities. Fear is what prevents us from changing what we've always done. You know, we did it at work. And so it's going to be that way in the year 2023, even if it was that way in 1987, damn it, it's going to stay the same, right? And, you know, I mean, we can look at issues such as trans, you know, people don't understand trans. I'm not trans. Um, they don't understand it, so therefore they're afraid of it. There's a lot of false information out there. This is not going to be a conversation about trans issues either, by the way. But I just want you to understand that what we don't understand, we fear. And what we fear, we don't contemplate. And what we don't contemplate, we create false narratives. And sometimes those false narratives are the narratives that keep us from doing anything. They prevent us from moving forward prevent us from doing something slightly different or different than what we thought. For example, there are many, many, many people uh, that have been alive for a long time that hold on to dear life, that elections are the way to go forward. And don't get me wrong. I have never not voted in an election. Okay. So what I'm saying to you now has nothing to do with telling you don't vote. So I really, it's my hope upon hopes that people really listen to what I say not insert things in their brain into what I say, but actually listen to what I'm saying and fundamentally change at least how they hear it. Think it through. Okay. Think it through. All right. So, you know, we, we, we've seen countless times how people's fear of things like marijuana, pot, doobage, the devil's cabbage. Okay. We're, we're, we're terrified of marijuana, not we, hopefully, hopefully nobody watching this show is terrified of marijuana. Jesus Christ, if you are, we got problems. Okay. But the point is, is that there was a lot of people out there that were just terrified of marijuana. It's going to lead to the end of the universe. Okay. And they were terrified of interracial dating, terrified of the gayness, terrified of government spending, or more importantly, because they never understood how any of this could happen. They just never contemplated, or they hear somebody like myself tell you that we can afford a Green New Deal, that we can afford to get rid of student debt, that we can afford to do all these things. When I say afford, I don't mean your tax dollar. I mean, just outright do it. And when people hear that, they go, yeah, that, that's a neat idea. You know, maybe someday we can do that. But this is just not the time for it right now, you know, because we got to worry about honey, tiny hands over there. So we can't, we can't be forceful and pushing for anything because people just don't understand. That's what it comes down to is people just don't understand. Okay. And so if you look at some of the insanity that people were jointly, all collaboratively angry about, and you look at some of the leftists out there that get bitterly angry at people that vote Democrat and they rail on it, hate and anger, all oh, these standard shit libs and all this stuff. And they're not talking about the politicians. They're talking about regular people. OK, but when they say those things, people don't get all upset at them, but they get upset at a guy like Grumbine for getting upset about you not understanding the economic system. They get upset at Grumbine for being raging and angry and and like just ready for change, desperate for change. And I know damn well that there are fearful people out there that are preventing that change from happening. 
They're fearful people that are preventing that change from happening. They may say in private quarters, one-on-one, -on -one, hell, they may even say it in um, you know, their social media accounts that they're all for getting rid of student debt. But they aren't going to fight for it. Why? Because they don't fundamentally understand that it doesn't cost the taxpayer or anyone else a nickel. It's simply you just do it. You just wipe it out. But we, you know, in the end, if you don't know this stuff, you're not going to fight for this stuff. And once you do understand MMT and you realize that none of the people you've ever thought you voted for have done anything with this knowledge at all, from AOC to Bernie, you name it, none of them, not one of them. Definitely not Biden. <laughs> But when you understand that and you say to yourself, well, I'm just going to just going to vote anyway and, and, and hope for the best. I'm not smart enough to tell you not to vote, but I am smart enough to tell you that your vote isn't changing anything. Please never, ever come to me. I'm not stupid. I'm, not, I'm just not a stupid dude. And don't act like you think I haven't thought of the results of not voting. Of course, I've thought of the results of not voting. I'm not telling you not to vote. I need to make sure you understand that I didn't say don't vote. But I'm telling you it's a placebo. It's a placebo. You believe that your vote mattered. You believe that you're selecting the next nominee for the Democratic Party. You believe that you have a say-so in the bills that they put forward. You believe these things. And so, therefore, since you believe, you act on it. Even though there's no, none, zero evidence that anything you did in that space bore any fruit whatsoever. You believe that it did. And so you go and you do it over and over and over again. And then you feel the chutzpah, that like, uh, that heavy sack, that thud you know, thud, you drop it on the table. Yeah. You feel compelled to tell me to voting is so important. Like you've got it down. Like I didn't think about it. folks. I vote in every election, but I put zero stock, 0.0% 0 .0 stock in the outcomes of these things, because I have never seen any one of them not lie and tell you the national debt is scary. I've never seen any one of them not lie and say that taxes don't fund spending. I've never once seen any one of them ever say that we could eradicate student debt for all without having any impact to taxpayers whatsoever. I've never seen any of them say that. None, zero. If you have, by all means, show me. I know we talked to John Yarmouth, but guess what? He ain't around. And he really didn't do a whole lot with that knowledge. It was very depressing how little he did do with that knowledge. I mean, he's just one person, right? But without, you know, let me step back. I want to step back. So a lot of this conversation here was truly predicated on me watching a show, interestingly enough, on the role of psilocybin mushrooms in the 60s counterculture and the expansion of people's minds in the 60s as they contemplated new ideas and they broke the shackles. And see, the shackles are put on us intentionally. They're mental shackles. And they're put on us by our government, literally by our government. CIA has done this over and over again. You know, the CIA was the one that put LSD out there because they were going to use it as a truth serum. But then thank God for Timothy Leary, who did the research, did the work, and found out that LSD actually was this incredibly important medicinal way of expanding your mind, of creating new neural receptors in the brain. And I think to myself, if there wasn't so many fearful conservative type people whether or not my father could have gotten on some sort of psilocybin routine that would have awakened his brain in other areas because he had something that will never be profitable to cure called progressive supranuclear palsy. 
And it's like the brain dies little by little. And you could see, I was there for a few moments. My mom and brother and all were around my dad when he died um, more so. Like I was there when he died the last week there. I was physically there with them the whole time, but they were there for years, (laughs) years of the collapse of my father's health. And you would literally see him doing something. Then all of a sudden it would stop. Why? Because that part of his brain literally died in the moment that you were there. You were there, you watched, he suddenly could not lift his arm or he could not, his fingers couldn't move or he couldn't swallow anymore, something like that. Well, there is evidence, big time evidence out there that shows that psilocybin mushrooms, magic mushrooms, tripping mushrooms, literally create new neural receptors in the brain, create new neural paths, open up new parts of the brain, new dimensions to your thought process. But we've been stifled from this stuff for so long, so, so long, okay? And the idea that something like psilocybin mushrooms are illegal to me is unconscionable. It's unconscionable. But my outrage would offend someone if I got angry on this camera right here. Because after all, only things that everybody agrees upon are allowed to show that anger, okay? Well, I'm telling you things that maybe other people aren't talking about. Maybe they are. I don't know. I don't really pay attention. What I can tell you, though, is that the reason why things like psilocybin mushrooms were made illegal is not to prevent the little kids from dying because there's nobody dying from psilocybin mushrooms. There's no one dying from that, okay? There's no one dying from LSD, period. There's not. There's simply not, okay? So what exactly is it? Here's the thing. If you've been listening to our recent podcast interviews with David Correa and uh, Tyler Wall, you realize ultimately that police are in the business of creating order. They want to create order, not just order that you know of, but order that requires you to behave differently in the way that they just subjectively decide to create it. But that order is there to keep you fearful, to keep you, you, you're afraid of police for a good reason. Every time one comes behind you, expecting to pull you over for a taillight, pull you over for something. You don't know what it is. You don't even know what you're doing. You're just out getting milk. And there they are pulling you over. The fear is baked into you. And then they walk in with their chest puffed out. License and registration. Now, for white people like myself, I'm still afraid of them. But for people in poor and minority communities, that's the last bit of public service they get is the police. So everything they need, whether it be for a um, a psychotic break, for a child with autism, for anything, the police are sent out there. And they don't have good experiences with the police. The police kill them, shoot them for no reason, unarmed. Okay. And this kind of law and order mindset is so baked into our brains. And one of the things they said was kill the cop in your brain, kill that cop in your brain. You don't need to have a cop mindset, but that cop mindset keeps us on this very narrow corridor of what is possible and what is not possible out of fear, complete and utter fear. Okay. And so when I tell you guys that we can organize outside the duopoly, some chucklehead will come behind and say, did he just say not to vote? And you want to just smack the taste out of their mouth for lying and misrepresenting, don't you? Well, I do. I do. I do. I, I I really despise when people don't listen to the exact words you say and then substitute them with bullshit that you didn't say. Okay. But I'm telling you right now, if we don't decopify our brains, decop our brains and stop thinking in terms of these very linear rules, we are not going to be able to do anything because the system is self-reinforcing. The system does not want us to have nice things. Not because of any special requirement to make us hate ourselves, but the more insecure we are, the more controllable we are. 
And this is kind of a, a prison of sorts. It's a, it's a slavery, a debt slavery that they put us in. That's a little bit different than chattel slavery, but not much because all the while you still got cops floating around everywhere. So all this is very scary, right? I see a lot of people proudly, we support the boys in blue. And I'm wondering why they do that because simultaneously, many of them are beating their wives and, you know, doing drunk driving and other crap. Maybe it's to throw off the scent. I don't know. I don't know. But when I tell you that the things we want, we can't vote our way there. Again, there's somebody that's going to worthlessly tell me that I'm saying not to vote. I didn't say that. Do you understand? I did not say that. So if anyone ever says that, they're literally lying, okay? I am telling you, though, that you vote. That's a single act. It's a one-time act. You go, I voted. Now the work begins. The work began before. The work begins after. We have to teach people. We have to free their brains of the shackles. We have to give them information. Because without them understanding this stuff, my anger when I talk about people dying from austerity misses them. They just think I'm an angry white guy on the camera yelling at the camera because they have no idea. They still believe the Rothschilds own this and that the national debt is going to drown them and everything else. So everything I'm saying just literally doesn't make any sense to them at all. It's like, Absolute not sticking at all. My point has always been because I know people are angry. I keep trying to tap into the anger, tap into that willingness to see the world differently. And alas, it works for every other subject but economics. It works for every other subject, apparently. But even in that space, even in the space where people accept the anger and they don't get judgy about, oh, he's fighting for the poor because of austerity, oh, fucking ass, all yelling at the camera, right? Because they don't understand and their ignorance prevents them from seeing my rage as righteous and they substitute their own shackles on the subject and ignore it because of it, right? But it's the same thing. All you have to do is go to a friend, any friend, and say, hey, I'm thinking about going on an ayahuasca trip. I'm thinking of going into native territory and doing a mescaline trip to try and free myself of the PTSD and free myself of the uh, addictions that I have or free myself of whatever. And they're going to be like, oh, my God, that's scary. What are you thinking? What are you talking about? Oh, my God, don't do that. It's terrifying. So each of these things that a little bit outside the mainstream, they're scary, wouldn't be prudent, terrified, boogeyman scary things. And until we get those people, regardless of whether you like them or not, regardless of whether they're a shit lib or not, regardless of whether they're a Republican or not, if you're not actively educating them, and if you know, uh, presuming you know, if you're not actively educating them, their fears will prevent any change from happening. And again, I don't believe you're voting your way there. So that means it's going to require something different than just voting. Again, I said the word just because there's terrible people out there that constantly think that I'm saying don't vote. It's not what I said. Okay? I, I just need you to understand I'm not saying don't vote. So get that shit out of your brain so we can focus on what I am saying. Okay. If we don't teach people this stuff. They're not going to be outraged that we're not getting student debt written off. They're not going to be outraged in the right way that they don't have health care, that we don't have a Green New Deal. You know, Green New Deal is not particularly left or right, even though people assume that it would be. The fact of the matter is, is that climate crisis is a survival thing. 
it's survival for Republicans, libertarians, even Democrats, whoever. It's a survival thing. It's not really a wing thing, right? It's not really a wing thing. It's just a thing that if you want to live and you don't have some sort of special rocket ship and a special apartment in the sky somewhere that you need to pay attention to. And because people don't think that we can create money out of thin air, not that we can. See, this is the thing. Well, we could print the money. I hear that constantly. But it's not we could print the money. We don't print money. The government literally spends it into existence. It didn't spend your hard-earned tax dollar. We know this. We should know that. I know this. You, The people that watch this program on the regular know this. But for somebody new that doesn't know this, we spend money into existence every single day, not sometimes every time. And when we tax it, we tax it back. We literally purge. When I say purge, when the government spends money, it creates a reserve inside the banking system. A reserve is like a dollar, but it's not a dollar. It's inside the system. It's in the banking system only. It can never be lent out into the real world. We have paper dollars. We have digital dollars. We have representative of dollars. The banking system to enable us to make payments back and forth to each other has something called reserves. They keep reserves in the system. So when a dollar is spent, a reserve is created. When that dollar is taxed back, reserve is eradicated. It's gone. So taxes delete reserves. They purge reserves from the banking system. Okay. But they don't fund anything. The dollar is deleted. Once you get that part, the rest of it is almost gravy train. It's not, well, if you just keep printing more money, you'll have inflation. Folks, we always, from the dawn of time, spend money into existence. And from the dawn of time, we tax it out of existence, even on the gold standard, okay? Even on the gold standard. The difference here is that when we're talking about programs, we've been so conditioned, and it's been by a well-oiled machine, by the way. We've been so conditioned to believe that we can't afford it, that we can't do those things and that we have to go buy it from the private sector. We've been convinced because government has been so bad for so long because it's captured. We've been convinced that we should privatize things. This is a mind fuck. This is one of those real honest to God psyops between cops keeping law and order, not law and definitely not order that you and I would appreciate. They're there to protect capital. They're not there to protect you and I. So when you pick up the phone and call them, they're not there to service you. They're there to make sure that there's no impact to people's property. Property is what they care about. Okay. Property is what they're there for. And it's not the individual cop. You might find a nice guy that's a cop, but in reality, the system is designed for their role to be to maintain the capital order, to maintain the free flow of capital. And that's why you can't have people in hallucinogenics because it violates the capital order. Because what does it do? If your brain is locked into certain rote things, you brush your teeth at nine, you go to bed at nine, you eat certain frosted flakes every day at 930 or whatever, whatever thing you do every day. The thing is, is that when you take psilocybin mushrooms, magic mushrooms. It's like takes all those things, shakes it up in a bucket, rolls it on the table, and it's like a new jigsaw puzzle allowing you to put pieces back together in a different way. That's why people say it helps cure PTSD. It helps cure addiction. It helps cure a number of things, overeating, all these different aspects, okay? But you wouldn't know that because you're afraid and because you've been conditioned to be afraid. Okay, so we have cops that maintain this order. We have the propaganda from the media that convinces us that we can't have nice things, that the country is broke. We have all sorts of other reinforcing things that go on through the system that keep us scared and afraid. You know, that whole 
you know, I can't even begin to explain it to you, but it's like there's an awakening that you have when you realize that you could pull back from that and not allow it to consume you. You allow it not to consume you. So when I think about like why people are unwilling to do things, why people are unwilling to get behind ideas, are unwilling to, um, you know, kind of really roll up their sleeves. They're always wondering, what can I do? And, and it never feels actionable because the problem is, is that we don't have all the answers. If we had all the answers, it would already be solved, right? So in the absence of knowing end to end the plan from A to Z, we do nothing. We do nothing because what if we do the wrong thing? Oh my God. What if we go in a wrong way? Oh my God. Right. And, you know, I think to myself, you know, there's a lot to be afraid of. You know, you sign a, a bill, a debt, you know, you, you take out a loan and you don't understand the terms and conditions that can really come back to haunt you. You know, look at the student debt industry. I bet you most people didn't think that it was possible that they could owe more in student debt than they originally took out by the end of it. I bet you most people had no idea what they were really getting into. And yet here we are. And we literally could get rid of everyone's. But for those that don't understand, we could get rid of it. They're busy explaining why should we pay for your student debt? In the absence of understanding how this works, why wouldn't they think that? In the absence of understanding how money works, they wouldn't possibly believe that you could just wipe out people's student debt without it costing someone's taxpayer money. Each step through this process, each step through this process, we've been conditioned to believe exactly the wrong thing. We believe so many things that are just not true. And we act on them as if they are. And it maintains the order as it is. So going in, you know, when you see cattle going through those lines where they get the fucking hole popped in their head, you know, that's what I feel like when they try to hurt us into voting for XYZ candidate. And, you know, if you haven't checked out of that process of believing what they're saying, if you're still continuing to help share and spread the lie, okay, you're reinforcing the propaganda. You're reinforcing the narrow lines that prevent us from making change. You're reinforcing the narrow scope potential even for change. You know, you know, I, I think about how many people have these weird issues, weird fears. Fears that just seem so like, how could you even believe that? And yet at the same time, though, in the absence of more information, in the absence of knowledge, in the absence of being able to understand, you're likely to be like a caveman sitting there drawing hieroglyphics in the cave. Fearful. You know, I don't know if how many of you all have ever seen the crudes. But the dad was like, we live in the cave, period. Cave is life. And the daughter's like, no, dad, the cave is not life. We're not living. This isn't living in the cave. We're not dying. That's the difference. But we're definitely not living. And so many people, so many old timers, so many freaking people that are just uneducated, or been propagandized for much longer than others continue to fall back on the standard. This is how we got to do it. We just got to go through these same motions we've gone through every single day for the last however long. And they never change the dance steps to get a different result. You know, that saying doing the same shit over and over again, expecting different results is the very definition of insanity. And yet there are people that will continue to push. We just got to get more Democrats in office. 
you get more Democrats in office. Do they stack the court? No. Do they codify Roe v. Wade? No. Do they take and legalize across the federal law marijuana? No. Think of all the people that would be released from jail that have been serving years of their life away from their children, away from their families, that would suddenly be released and given a new lease on life. And yet, no. Each step in this process, imagine all the people that went back to school during the great financial crisis in 2008, 2009, that now have huge debt and they're in the last years of their earning potential. And yet they're going to carry huge debt loads of student debt. And we don't, we have not mastered the idea that we have to educate so many people that we have to continue to talk to people about these things and change thought hearts and change minds. Because unfortunately there's a part of you that will probably say, well, yeah, if we can get them all to agree, then we can get them to vote for these things. But those things aren't on the ballot. Many States have no line item or, you know, referendum or anything else. You have to get people willing to do things outside of the electoral process. But I'm constantly being chased in my inbox by people assuring me that I've got it all wrong, that we just need to vote our way there and it'll be paradise. Good friends of mine, people that I know and love, telling me that it's just a simple matter of people not voting. But I want you to realize this. If you listen to Tyler Wall and you listen to David Correa, there's constant effort to try to reform the police. And all it is is putting lipstick on a pig. That's all the whole thing is, is lipstick on a pig, re reforming the police. Abolition is the only way forward. But guess what? To abolish the police, everybody's scared. They don't know what to do because after all, how are we going to do that? What happens when the bad guys come to our house and break in and rape and pillage? Well, you know what? It brings up a whole new set of worms, a whole new set of problems, doesn't it? The reason why the police exist is to enforce and reinforce and continue to enforce private property laws. Okay. You'd have to get rid of private property. When I say private property, I'm not talking about your hairbrush. I'm not talking about, you know, your possessions. I'm talking about ownership of the commons. I'm talking about ownership of society. I'm talking about if you're going to live in an economy that is exclusionary by, by design, where some people are doing great, others are fucking scraping the bottom. If that's the economy that you want to stay in existence, you're creating the very conditions by which crime will commence. Okay. And so if you create those conditions, you have to get rid of those conditions to make it so that you can solve those. That's a huge order, folks. Obviously, it's a huge order. Most people have no idea the difference between personal possessions and private property. Most people have no understanding of what the potential of a government is that doesn't care about capital and doesn't care about their profit motive and focuses instead on making society whole. They don't understand it. They couldn't possibly do it. They've been told a thousand times, well, Stalin killed 10 million people and look at all the times Mal killed somebody and blah, blah, blah. And all I did was spend hours upon hours of my life researching it, inter interviewing some of the best and brightest on China, Mao, I've gone through the beginning phases of the Russian revolution. We haven't talked really about Stalin. We did have some interview opportunities with Asha previously. There's a lot going on that that has to be unpacked, the Soviet, et cetera. Instead of hearing the truth of those things, we hear the propaganda, the CIA led propaganda. And so we're afraid because what did the United States government do forever? It built the red scare. The Democratic Party fanned the flames of the Red Scare when Bernie was running. We don't need a socialist. You know what socialism does. It kills. So each one of these things 
is intended. They need a permanent underclass. They need people desperate. Why? Because desperate people are afraid. And the people that are fearful will do things differently. They'll stay on the, they'll stay on the narrow lines. And the people that are really starving are going to do whatever it takes. And they're going to break into a house and steal some food. They might break into a car and steal some money. But let me ask you a question. How many of those people breaking into your car are getting rich breaking into your car? I want you to think about it for a minute. None of them. Nobody gets rich on change out of the change drawer in your car, the console in your car. No one gets rich doing that. No one gets rich boosting a wallet from someone. No one gets rich doing this stuff. As much as I hate people doing things like that and hurting people and, and violating people because there's two sides to this, right? But as much as I hate that, I understand that when you create conditions that prevent people from being able to exercise freedom and justice and live a life of happiness and, and completeness and, and not be starving and so forth and not be unhoused, unhomed, whatever. When you think about that, this is what your lack of willingness to break the shackles and stop doing the march of the voter, I will vote, I must vote, and that's the only thing you focus on. You think that getting politicians to understand this stuff is suddenly going to be the key to everything? Folks, their job, once they get in there, is to give you the feeling that you've got power while simultaneously the ownership class of this country wields its power. And by this country, this country is not just this country. The, the ownership class owns the world, folks. They're multinational corporations, global corporations, folks that have more money than you could ever imagine. And more importantly, they have wealth far beyond the cash holdings that they have. They will always be okay, unless they're not okay, by the way. And there are people afraid of talking about that stuff, people afraid of learning about Bastille Day, people afraid of learning about the real rudiments of breaking free. Now imagine, I, 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 some of the people I talked to, I'm, we're going to role play for a minute. Yes, Amasa. Yeah, sir, I'm not running away, sir. No, I'm not running away, sir. And then all of a sudden, somebody says, well, if you just vote, for, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to end slavery forever. And so what happens? Lincoln ends slavery. Civil War, of course, happens. Let's not forget that. But slaves weren't really free, were they? Because during Reconstruction, they gave the Southerners all their power back. They allowed them back in government, gave them property. Nothing fundamentally changed. And it's in place of plantations, they gave vagrancy laws that kept slaves freed men, slaves, and they would put them in jail and allow them to work as slaves anyway for the state now. Forget the 13th Amendment, right? All of this stuff makes you laugh when you think about somebody saying, well, you just vote, you vote, you got to vote. So many people aren't voting. If they all voted, we could get rid of slavery. Folks, it took a war to get rid of just the chattel part of it. But the real slavery has never stopped because this nation is built on capitalism. It requires an underclass. It requires a permanent underclass. It requires you to have delusions of grandeur that someday you'll be an, a millionaire while simultaneously doing the steps each day. Walking. Same exact robotic motion and you want to be thinking you're clever telling somebody well actually you just vote oh you didn't think about voting whatever went through your brain how is it you couldn't have thought of voting steve my goodness you would think that you didn't run a political show or a education show or been involved in the brain you wouldn't think you would know any of this stuff because shit just vote right just about voting 
just about voting, man. Oh, we don't have to build any power outside of the electoral process. We don't have to build parallel systems. All that, that's just crazy. It's just not enough people voting. Just get them to vote. It'll, it's, it's, it, it'll be better. It'll, it'll self-heal, I promise. But it doesn't. It never gets better, ever. It only gets worse. Because the system is not there to take care of you, but you believe, you believe it is there to take care of you. You can't fathom that it's not. This does not mean that a government isn't, shouldn't be we the people. It doesn't mean any of that. It means that what we have isn't that though. It means what we have isn't that. And you can't vote your way out of that because the people that want it to be that are in power. It doesn't take much to remember AOC standing on Pelosi's desk. We were all, many of us got snowed because we wanted so badly to believe in a very, very short order. AOC became the new establishment in very, very short order. Every time you look, every time you look, you realize that voting alone isn't going to solve any of your problems. And there are terrible people out there that will put so much weight on voting. Like this is the, this is it. This is the Super Bowl vote. Because they don't feel like putting in the work to do the educating and stuff. They feel like party first and then everything else, whatever. And that is precisely why we're stuck and fucked where we are right now. We're stuck and fucked right now because of that shallow, narrow mindset. I'm going to go back to LSD for a minute in the 60s. Everybody was tripping. Everyone was tripping. I bet you Jerome Powell did a few mescaline trips, probably did a shit ton of other trips. I don't know why he's as fucked up as he is. Then again, I can't imagine why so many freaking deadheads ended up becoming part of the capitalist class after. I couldn't imagine having been lucky enough to be alive during all that and coming out the other end a fucking snake-bitten capitalist, okay? But sure shit, many of them are. And I'm a deadhead, baby, through and through, okay? I missed the best part of it because I was born in 69. I wish I could have been like 16 years old in 1965. My God, I would have been just hell on wheels. It would have been the greatest, okay? But in reality, we look at that and everyone's brains were expanding. They were considering so many new things. They weren't walled off. Now, there was some crack pottery that came out of that, but the point was people were thinking. They were not trapped in the narrow bubble of just do this, just do that. We don't have that today. We've got a lot of good little lemmings that follow orders, sir. That follow orders, sir. And they teach their kids to follow orders, sir. And because they want to protect them, they're afraid. They're afraid. I understand. I do. I'm a parent. I get it. See, this is not in denigration of that. When you don't know better, it's impossible to do better. When you're afraid, you do things differently than you do when you're in the knowledgeable zone. When you know what's going on, you do things differently. And so each one teach one has been the moniker of this organization from day one. From day one, each one teach one has been the moniker. Each one reach one, each one teach one. We've lost a lot of that. A lot of that got swept away because, I don't know, reasons. People people are depressed. They're, they're checked out, man. They don't think they have any power, and they're tired of hearing somebody shame them into voting again. They're tired of hearing somebody run around smacking them on the knuckles saying, you got to vote. What do you mean you're not going to vote? 
You want Trump? Right? So they're depressed. They feel no power. They have no agency. They think the shit's just going to never get better. And so they check out. Because the only solution once you check back in is, well, we got a door knock and we got a phone bank and we've got a, oh my God, the Republicans. Back to that shallow, thimble deep, non satisfactory solutioning that all it gets you is 100% a placebo. Okay. It's a placebo. Folks, we've got to get people to understand. And, you know, I'm not going to lie. I'm a huge advocate for legalization. I'm a huge advocate for expanding our minds. I'm a huge advocate for people literally not being jailed for stupid shit. I'm a huge advocate right now. And I got to admit, it's not like a lifelong thing here. I came to understand. I came to learn. I didn't, I wasn't born knowing anything. Hell, there's so much I've got to learn still. It's not even funny. Every day I learn something new. But I was born believing that the cops were the good guys. And you watch all the shows, all the true crime, all these things. They glamorize cops. They glamorize cops. They make cops the be all end all. It's all about reinforcing law and order. You don't want to be the bad guy at the end of the cop car, getting put into the back of the car. You don't want to be that guy. It's very effective. It's just like the fear of inflation prevents people from fighting to spend money when reality is, is that it's not inflation that's your problem. The problem is, is that your wages didn't keep up with inflation because capitalism, okay? Capitalism demands, and that's why they shipped all the labor out of the U.S. They shipped the labor out of the U.S. to low-cost centers, thinking that we could live as a service economy. Well, folks, there's no more going to the mailroom, working your way up, because there is no more mailroom, okay? You don't get any of those opportunities, 0% of those opportunities. It's a service economy, period, now. And guess what? In an upcoming episode of Macro and Cheese, I interview Michael Hudson again, 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 again. (laughs) Nice to have access to Michael Hudson. But I interview Michael Hudson, and he talks about how the U.S. has put itself in an impossible situation to bring manufacturing back while in the midst of a class war isn't going to work. You cannot just bring the jobs back that way because there is a class war and our salary demands are going to be greater than elsewhere. So what are they going to do? They're going to push austerity on us. They're going to make us hate our lives to the point where we're willing to do anything, which is a form of slavery. It's a form of slavery. So one of the things that I asked Actually, I didn't ask. I don't want to take credit for this. One of the things one of the people asked, if you guys listen to this week's Macro and Cheese, please fucking listen to this week's episode of Macro and Cheese. It's RP Live with Tyler Wall and David Correa. It's very worth your time. And they asked, someone asked, what can we do? And it's obvious that without getting rid of capitalism, You're just going to end up with private freaking militias, private security forces for capital. If you get rid of cops as it is today, you get warlords and stuff like that. Without getting rid of private property, there is no getting rid of cops. So someone asked, well, what can we do? And he says, first things first, you cannot think that abolition of police is some aspirational goal. You need to begin doing it today, learning to live it today. And you do that by asking yourself a couple questions. Do I need to call the police? Yes or no? No, I don't probably need to call the police. So you don't. What happens when I call the police? Do I feel safer? Do I feel more secure? Do they come in there? License or registration, hands up on the top, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you call because some autistic kid is screaming in the streets 
and they come out there and tase him and hog tie an autistic kid, a kid sitting there hiding in a cubicle in a school that lashed out because someone touched his ears and the sensory wouldn't allow it. He fucking lashes out and the cops yank him out of his little cubby hole, hog tie him up behind hands behind little plastic strap cutting into his wrists and freaking ankles. You have to ask yourself, should I be calling the cops and why would I call the cops and what do I expect to get from the cops? You begin to make change by making changes, subtle changes in how you behave. And so part of my message today is in order to end the fear, in order to change the lack of ideas and the lack of imagination, lack of willingness to go beyond just voting, you have got to start taking micro steps today by teaching each other by talking to one another, by getting in small groups. I hope we can do this at RP. Small groups where people talk through these issues together. Start building plans, thinking through problems. Not just watching live streams and fighting on social media or checking out worse. The worst is checking out. We need to begin to build that kind of relationship with one another where we learn from each other and we teach and we grow. And unfortunately, MMT is one of the things that we have to teach, but one of the things we have to teach. And it's a very important one of the things we have to teach. But simultaneously, when you teach MMT, someone says, well, how come we don't have these things? That question alone should be enough to radicalize someone from believing we're just going to vote our way there. I have no tolerance and no patience for someone that lectures me about coming back and we're going to just vote our way there. I have no tolerance or patience for it anymore. I am tired of running in, in slow motion or still. I'm tired of trying to climb a greased pole. You should be too, but if you aren't, it's all about educating yourself to free yourself from the strictures of the the cop lies that you've been taught, the, the structure and organizational lies you've been told that you believe that you suck onto. I'm so tired of saying these things that I perhaps come off angry, and I am angry. But you will be too when you wake up and you see these things yourself. When If you ever cross the bridge into learning this stuff and don't just sit on the sideline, you'll be angry too. You will be. It's impossible to know that we could save people that are in the hospitals that we just don't have the money to pay for or people in the streets that we just don't have the money to pay for or all the poor immigrants trying to come to this country that we created by wars everywhere and sanctions, et cetera, and we don't do what we can do because, after all, we're out of money. When you understand that that doesn't have to be that way, you'll be angry. Unless you choose to stay stupid and stuck and ignorant and trapped and just go through the motions once again. You've got to decolonize your mind. The colonizers have taken over. The law and order colonizers have filled your brain full of lies. All to protect capital. All to protect private property. You've got to learn. You've got to take the time to educate yourself or we all stay stuck. Unfortunately, this isn't one of those things where you could just be a, a special person and run off and do it all. You need everyone else to get on the program too. You need everyone else to learn a class analysis too. You need everyone else to understand how money is created by the federal government Two, you need everyone to understand that government spending is not inflationary. What is inflationary is the government paying higher prices on things. What is inflationary is not having enough supply to meet demand, but it's never about printing money. You need to know these things. You need to understand that hyperinflation is not about just high prices. Hyperinflation is about corruption. It is about a complete collapse of production in your state. It's about not being able to get the goods and services. And so you print a million of them 
million bucks, trillion bucks, because there's only one or two things. Re- the hyperinflation isn't from printing money. It's from places like Germany and Weimar not having the productive capacity because the entire industrial district is on strike or because they have debt denominated in French francs, not because of anything else. And until you come to grips with these things, you won't confidently be able to say, of course we can. You'll listen to somebody who only half listens to what we say. And the, yeah, we can always print the money to do it. We never said print the money. You never heard me say we can just print the money. That's not how it works. There is no printing of money. So when you hear Wolf or any of the other clowns saying, we're going to just print the money. Okay. We don't print money. I've said this so many times. What do we do? We keystroke it into accounts. When Congress writes a bill, it spends money into existence. The bill itself is a set of legal instructions that tells the Fed to mark up an account. That account is the Treasury's account. The Treasury then spends from its account to contractors that it is hired to do work. And then once they get paid, then they go buy goods and services and other people get paid. This is how money gets through the economy. It's not private banks, although private banks are another problem we can deal with. It's not them. you got to remember government has the power. And anything other than government has the power is because we purposely let it be that way because we couldn't unshackle our minds and realize, unfortunately, There may be more pain and suffering fighting back than you thought because you ain't getting there voting. Vote. I'm not telling you not to vote, but you're not solving the problem by just voting. You did that with Biden, and guess what? You didn't get your $2,000 checks. We didn't get student debt relief. We didn't get a Green New Deal. We didn't get Medicare for all. We didn't get anything. We got a bunch of austerity still and a bunch of platitudes. And now we're about to have a quote unquote red wave strike the United States because this is what happens when Democrats have a supermajority. Okay. But this is the show anyway. It's performative. It's performative. And if you actually took the time to learn these things, you would be angry like I am. Unfortunately, the tone police are very real and they're very disgusting. They're worse than regular cops because they shut down the discourse. They shut down the rage. They shut down the anger. They shut down real meaningful pointed discussions. And by making it chilly and icy to be angry, they destroy the motion that could be taken to really, really amp up and ramp up a militant union class struggle union style effect the tone police are every bit as propagandized as you can get and the tone police by default end up supporting the establishment they end up keeping the establishment large and in charge it's not noble you didn't do some good thing being a tone policer is not some higher calling It's literally being the dog of the establishment, biting people. Don't be that person. Never allow yourself to be a tone policer. Never allow yourself to sit there and decide that someone's outrage is wrong. Take a moment to think about why someone's outraged and learn. And then come together and build something to fight back. Because without it, We don't have a prayer. Anyway, tomorrow is the 4th of July, folks. That's all I'm saying for it. Have a great day, everybody. (laughs) I am out of here.